today we'll be telling you about the five things that you actually have to look out for before actually investing in property. This information is very important not just for people who are beginning, who are in the beginning stages of investing in property. However, people who, are, who have also been in the game because it's a huge problem because now a contract actually binds you to whatever you sign, right? Because you don't want to find yourself in a situation whereby somebody wrote something and then you didn't actually see that term and condition. You Hello, hello, hello. Happy New Year. No, well, we, we are profitable, professional, professional property, property investors. investors. Yes, this is Lebu. Neo. And today we'll be telling you about the five things that you actually have to look out for before actually investing in property. These are the five, five, five things that you actually have to be looking out before you actually invest in a property or before you actually step into the property game. This information is very important, not just for people who are beginning, who are in the beginning stages of investing in property. However, people who, are, who have also been in the game, because sometimes you find out that you've had a property for about five years, but scaling up is, is, is quite tricky. Yeah. So now this, is a, this, this information will actually help out. Definitely, because now sometimes it happens that you actually buy a portfolio, right? Or you buy a property and you tell yourself that, ooh, I'm a professional property investor, but you are not profitable. Being a property investor means that you're actually going to be cash flow positive from the first month that you actually go into the deal, right? So now with a rental um, accommodation, right? You need to be profitable within the first month of you actually signing the deal. If not, you are not a professional property investor. Even with uh, flipping, you need to know your ROI, you need to have a margin whereby you will not settle for less. So now through these strategies or things that we'll be highlighting will actually equip you so that you advance yourself before you even go in the deal, you know that you're working, to, you're working towards these margins. And please, before we even start with this, if you haven't subscribed, please push that subscribe button and actually smash that notification that will actually tell you that when we actually uh, post you will be the first one to know. It's very important that you do that so that you become updated with all the content, the quality content that we're actually dishing out on a weekly basis. Let's go in. So, number one. Contract. Guys, I can't emphasize the importance of going through the contract. A contract with regards to real estate will actually help you. When you're going into real estate, you offer to purchase in this in this in this instance. It's very important to understand it when what's happening. So now this is where you work closely with your lawyer, also known as your conveyancer. Your conveyancer. I remember the first time. That's the that's the, that's the word that I was searching for. I remember the first time they were like, "Hey man, where's your conveyance? Did your conveyance actually read this?" I was like, "What are they saying? What is conveyance?" It's the first time I hear this. And so conveyancer is actually a lawyer that actually will, that will help you out in the property space now the reason why we emphasize that this is very important that you do that is because they know the ins and outs they know what every clause will say because you don't want to find yourself in a situation whereby somebody wrote something and then you didn't actually see that term and condition you know how we are when we get something i mean you get a new laptop and you're like no i know how to operate this thing mm. Only i don't, to find I don't out. need to read the the terms and conditions of the laptop right <laughs> so now what happens is that you actually go ahead and sign the contract without actually reading it right mm. so now the most important thing is that you actually need to go through the contract that you actually reading so now for example the contract that we actually on right now right mm. it actually stipulated that we need to actually put on down payment of around 10%, right? But now don't be afraid to actually go back and renegotiate the, the terms and conditions of the contract, right? But now, before we even go to renegotiating the terms of the contract, make sure that everything that's within the contract, you you will be actually uh, able to stick on that, on your word, right? I mean, this one of uh, renegotiating, it wasn't actually, from our side, it wasn't even renegotiating. What happened is that the bank gave us something like 95%. The bank gave us 95% bond, and then these, these the conveyancer of this person, the document that they sent us, the offer to purchase, said that we must pay them 10%. So now, can you already see, of course, there's, that 5% means a lot. Don't forget now, when you're dealing with a, a house over... It's a lot. It's a lot. Five hundred thousand, and even, then I'm gonna tell you about five percent. It's a lot of money. I mean, even looking at hundred thousand, right? Five percent of hundred thousand, it's like five thousand grand, right? It's a lot. It's five thousand grand. That's a, lot. a lot. You can do a whole lot of things with that five thousand grand. Mm -hmm. So now, 
you shouldn't be shy to actually renegotiate the terms and conditions. So now what happened with our situation is that the 10%, uh, we had to put in a down payment of 10%, which wasn't really a problem, right? But now the problem was that the bank was willing to give us 95%, right? We're not going to let that 5% go down. So now what we actually did is that we went on to renegotiate the terms and conditions of from the bank. True. And I mean, once you work with a conveyancer, that's also sometimes you find out... <laughs> Uh, this is one of the seven. We actually got this information from one of the seven is that uh, somebody will put in a clause Like let's say for instance if I want to buy a house and then I'll write my terms terms of reference That the person that I'll be buying for that they must sign only to find out that I was specifically saying Let's say they didn't have a pool and I told them that I want a pool That's the only time that I'll pay for the full amount or else we'll renegotiate that price down Definitely. So now if you as the seller sign that document without actually consulting not consulting. It's a huge problem. It's, a, it's going to be a problem. It's a huge problem because now a contract actually binds you to whatever you signed, right? Mm -hmm. So now if you just signed whatever on that particular document, you need to stick to your word, right? You know, sometimes, especially with the route that we're taking, um, distressed property, is that you know that you're buying the house as is. So no matter what's wrong, you're buying it as is. So now you can't go and complain and be like, hey man, you didn't tell me about the keys and you didn't tell me about you buying it as is. So even with that, that's when that comes to play the offer to purchase. Mm. Then the second part that we actually wanted to talk about is the estate agent, right? The estate agent is the, I don't want to say the, 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 the engine of your business, but now the, the estate agent is the person that will actually give you deals, right? So now when you're actually searching for deals, the estate agent is the one that will actually give you the deals, the ones that you actually need to package or actually buy. So now, where does it become a problem with your estate agent? It becomes a problem when the estate agent doesn't, doesn't really know what you're actually looking for, right? Because now what the estate agent's job is to actually sell you a deal, right? So now once you actually um, buy into a deal which is not profitable, which is not located in a good area, it's not the estate agent's fault, right? It's your fault as a prop as, as a, a property investor. Because now you need to do your homework. Before you actually consult an estate agent, you need to tell them that you want a 15% re uh, return on investment. This is the location that you're actually looking for. And this is the terms that you want the property to be in, right? So now, if you're working with people who are divorced and actually selling their houses, right? You need to actually state that to your um, estate agents before you actually buy or talk or uh, actually go view the particular place because now on if you have to go view the particular place without actually telling the estate agent what you actually want it would be it would seem as if you are actually wasting the estate agent's time true i mean with with estate agents estate agents as property investors they are friends you need to keep estate agents within your power team so now that will actually fuel your business if you have one estate agent and you're dependent on them to give you deals, it will be very tricky. Mm. But now if you have multiple estate agents that know the specific criteria that you want, the houses that you want. For instance, we are into distressed properties. So now our estate agents know that they mustn't send us you know, normal houses. When I'm saying normal, I'm sorry, like, what do you mean normal? I'm talking about houses that are on market bed. Our estate agents know that we're not looking for those types. So now they'll actually pass those deals and when they do get to distress, we specify that we want them 30% below. The reason why we want 30% below is because we want to, we added our fix, our refer and our deposit amount. So we're looking at a 15% profit for that. So now our estate agents already know and the inventory, the, the information that they're giving us is relevant to our particular criteria. So we're not wasting their time and they're not wasting ours. So with estate agents, it's very important that you are, as I did highlight, they are our friends. Number two is that you are very open to them. You do not want to be playing games as if you're Mr. Big, that, hey man, I'll, I'll buy 38 rooms by tonight. And then you go view and you waste their time. That will actually um, cause friction within the relationship. So it's very important that you are clear with the estate agents. And number two, guys, what I'd like to emphasize is that when estate agents, as I did say, not all of them, I'm not going to say that estate agents are bad people, but it's very important if they give you a deal and they tell you that it's 9% ROI that you don't just take that their duty is to give you that opportunity and then your duty is to run the numbers thoroughly so 
with your Lightstone report and get solid numbers and compare the two if it is a profitable deal or not. Because now, when you will be taking information from anybody who's saying that you, the return on investment is 10% or 15%, only to find out once you're in that deal, it's not, you will be hurt. And we don't want that for you. As we did say, we want profitable, professional property investment. All right. So now, the third one, the third one is your emotions. Keep your emotions out of investments. I hope that hit home. Keep yeah. your emotions out of the investment. You had to emphasize on that. Definitely. Because now what happens is that you see this beautiful property and on the negotiation part, right, um, you end up negotiating with this particular person, right? And they tell you that, no, I can't uh, sell you this property with that price, right? So now what happens is that you become emotional about it, right? Oh, this property is so beautiful. I love this one, right? You do not love property. You love the ROI on the property, right? So now if it does not make sense, you do not actually invest in it. True. Uh, with emotions, you know, sometimes that I'd be like, especially if you're just starting off, or even if you haven't been in the game, I'll be like, hey man, you know, guess what? I bought this property in this place where everybody knows that when you go to that place, that's the hot spot. Yeah. So then I just want to tell my friends that I bought this place. It has a pool, it has eight bedrooms, the view. You, do, you don't want to play that game, trust me guys. You want to put yourself in a position whereby your emotions overtook your ROI. I have a friend that's saying that, oh my God, this guy is in property, but I already bought a property this year, right? But now when you're looking at the ROI, it really doesn't make sense, right? Did he buy it for, or he or she, did she buy he or she? Did they buy it for, was it more personal or was it an investment? It was an investment, right? But now what happened is that they choked him out. They choked him out. They actually set a price which is, I mean, on the market when you're looking at it, it's below market value. But now once you add all of the expenses after buying the, the property, it's going to choke him out. So now he's happy that he actually bought an, a property. I'm happy for him, right? But now the ROI, does the ROI really make sense? Is it really worth it to be running around and getting an ROI of 5%? Yeah. I mean, with, with, with regards to ROI, what we're referring to every time when we say ROI, we're talking about return on investment. Return on investment, you run your numbers, thoroughly so. When you run your numbers, that's when you actually know the market around. Where am I buying? Yes. When you know the market, you already know what's the highest amount that I can actually take out Definitely. and what's the lowest. So if you bought that property whereby it was at its peak, the highest amount, only to find out that next year things will actually go down, it's going to be a problem for you. It's a problem. So you Big never, that's, an, that's why we would like to emphasize that never buy on appreciation. We buy, we rather buy on ROI, not appreciation. Appreciation is when I'm crossing my fingers that, yeah, man, next year this property will be, the profits will be good. And, Pray to God. And that time, you don't even have a formula, you don't even know why, what is going to force it up. You're just hoping because of time. You never buy on appreciation, rather buy on ROI. Definitely. And then the fourth one is the down payment, right? Always make sure, guys, that if you're going to buy, on um, financing right make sure that you have a down payment right so now how do you actually make sure that you have a down payment you actually go secure a down um, a, 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 a loan right a home loan a mortgage with your with your banker right this would be advisable to go to your to a bond originator to actually speak to them and find out if you do get approved how much will you get approved for and um how much would you actually need to take out for your down payment right so now when you're running your numbers before you actually go get the down payment what you actually need to do is to work around 20 percent. i think a 20 percent uh, down payment would be awesome what do you think yeah 20 percent is it's a good cushion yeah i it's think okay. if you can just put it on 20 percent, it depends guys again if your credit is bad hope for the worst case scenario man if it's good but you're still new in the game you're still working on 20 20 is good it's better to be safe it's better to be safe than sorry because last thing you want is investing in a property only to find out that you need to take out 20 k 20 percent and definitely. you didn't have that money definitely so now when you're running your numbers always work on the 20 percent down payment is there anything that you want to edit i think i think you covered you covered everything with the, with the down payment okay i think it's down payment and also your other costs that are included your transfer costs your legal fees if there are any in terms of 
the person that you'll be paying who helped you out read that contract if it's legit yeah, yeah. and i think also the numbers that you have to take into consideration again is your your expenses yes. in terms of if i'll be fixing this houses how much is the material going to do and in order to get that correct you have to have a power team you have to have a power team a power team will advise you correctly on that one definitely and then the last one which is number five, five. right this is your jv what are we talking about when we're talking about JV? I remember, you know, this, v, v, v. You know these lingos, I, I attended this property seminar and you can see that the people are speaking deep, man. They're deep in that uh, language. Telling me about JV. JV like, what is JV? Imagine being in a meeting for about 30 minutes and they're like, JV is good, JV is bad. I was in a JV. And what are these people talking about? What is JV? So JV is a joint venture. Mm -hmm. A joint venture is when you have two individuals, right, mm -hmm. coming together to actually push this pro property deal. It could be a flip, it could be a rental, right? So now, on your JV, right, what happens is that um, I found out that I don't have money to actually invest in a property, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that I go around looking for people to actually uh, invest with me within that property, right? So now what happens with the JV is that we come together, we both own that particular property and we're actually working on the deal together, right? So now what happens most of the time is that we get excited that we have someone. Yes, yes, finally. finally I got someone who wants to push property, but now what happens is that the personalities, the two personalities don't actually come together, right? Mm -hmm. They're always clashing, right? That doesn't really make From the, the most JV. little thing, man, I'll be like, hey man, I want my kitchen black. And then you'll be like, oh, why black? Why would you do a black kitchen? Like, come on, man. Well, sometimes it happens that uh, both of us actually contributed the same amount of money, right? That's but now the other one is trying to be boss. Like, right? Hey, man, run around, dog. I can't be running around, right? So now that's the most important thing on, on a JV, right? Just make sure that the two personalities actually come together, right? So now you don't want to be um, having a boss-like person mm -hmm. actually working for them. Is there anything that you want to edit before we JV, talk? I'd like to connect it with number one. Point number one, the contract. Always have a contract. Even if they're your brother, man. This is my brother, but I have a contract to save myself. I don't trust him. <laughs> so always have a contract that will stipulate in fine print that the relationship between the two, how are you guys going to work? If we're both going to be working together on the ground, then so be it. It must be in writing. If we're going to be splitting the profit 50-50, then so be it. It must be that way. If decision making will be done 40% and 60% or 60% and 40, it must be on paper. Everything must be on paper. And it's very important that you qualify your JV. What do I mean when I'm saying qualify? You look at the person, their personality. Do you want to work with them? Do you see a meaningful relationship with them? If not, do not hesitate. Do not stand. Look for somebody else. As long as you have that vision, if you can put that on table, you will find somebody. Definitely. So now those are the five, five things to look out before you go into property, right? Um, it was nice seeing you. See you next week, Thursday, 11 o'clock. Let's do it.